Hello there and welcome back to the Agassino Zynga Show episode number 686. Today is a special, very, very, very special live stream that I'll be doing and podcast courtesy of Louis Vuitton. <laughs> no, not courtesy. No. I'm actually just watching it on YouTube like everybody else. But it is Luke Ferrell Williams' big debut over there at Louis Vuitton Men's. So I'll be live streaming some of the show um, while I record the podcast at the same time. So that should be good to check out. I'll also be going over and checking over some of the recent articles featuring Ferrell Williams courtesy of what was it, New York Times and Vogue.com, where he spoke a little bit about his inspiration, his approach to the work and whatnot. And I'll be obviously, you know, opining with some of my expectations for the show itself. So it should be a pretty decent one. So strap in and get ready for that one. The show itself is meant to be coming on in the next few minutes. I think courtesy of the timer here on YouTube, it says 22 minutes. But if you know anything about fashion shows and you'll know that they're always late, they're probably as late as I am when I do live streams and stuff. So it says 22 minutes, but it's very unlikely it's going to be streamed on time. So we're going to be just checking in and waiting for it when it does appear. And then, of course, we'll be you know, dissecting it, talking about it and seeing what Pharrell was able to produce on there because it's a, as big as opportunity is for him. There's also a lot of pressure on this, especially considering the shoes he's going to fill, especially considering the fact that he doesn't have much experience. So he's going to really need to come out of the gates running here. But according to what I've read so far in the New York Times and Vogue article, he's got the right people around him. He's got the right attitude around this whole stuff. And essentially, his whole entire life's work has been being swaggy, dressing well, being into core interests and stuff. So even if he hasn't got traditional design experience, he should be more than capable with the help of a, a atelier and an amazing studio. He should be able to put together a coherent project, a coherent collection um, season in, season out with the assistance that he should have out there over at Louis Vuitton. So hopefully, fingers crossed, he does a good job. Um, but yeah, before we get into that one, let's just cover some quick news that I've obviously seen online that I wanted to kind of update some of you guys here on the pod first things first is that i'm a little bit nervous and getting a little bit agitated when it comes to the main night sale there has been no news no concrete kind of news to kind of get us over the line it seems like for the most part the glazers are doing this thing where they're essentially trying to dictate the narrative um of you know them leaving united or how they're going to leave until the very bitter end i would have assumed considering all the bad press they've had considering how fraught their tenure has been, that they would go out of their way to try their best to just get the fuck out of the club. But essentially, they're hanging on for a dear life and essentially trying to take us to the right until the end, until they decide to kind of finally let it go to new owners. Um, at the moment, I'm obviously still um, preferring that we have flipping Sheikh Jassim as our new owner because he's willing to take the club over 100%. There'll be no need for a partial ownership and it will be a good change of direction. And the fact that he wants to maybe have a better sporting project in mind that will maybe prioritise us winning trophies as opposed to finishing top four. That's obviously something that we need, which I think will then breed a culture of accountability um, in that club because we've not had that for a long time. We've had players essentially getting away with murder for the longest period of time. Because for whatever reason, Glazers have this weird way of looking at players where they see them as value um, propositions. So they lock them down in contracts if they don't play well under the proviso that if you put a player in a longer contract when another club comes in to try to purchase them, it means they'll have to pay more to get them out of that contract. So it's a very bizarre um, way to approach transfers and player you know, um, re retention and sale and stuff, but whatever. That's how they do business. So I'm hoping with Sheikh Jassim or whoever does end up taking over United in terms of full ownership, they have a little bit more of a cutthroat um, approach to football, to running a football club and also making sure that we are um, competing on all levels. Because at the moment, my main worry isn't even just how poorly run we are. My main worry is about the clubs in and around us who are essentially taking all the right steps in order to kind of get them to the next level. The likes of Aston Villa, <clears throat> the likes of Newcastle, of course, doing bits. Arsenal came into a hair's length of winning the Premier League with a very experienced team um, and a very inexperienced manager. So they're probably going to come back stronger. Liverpool finished the season pretty well. Chelsea had a blip of a season. So there's a lot of teams in the Premier League that are kind of doing bits and kind of getting on their way. There is no guarantee that we're going to finish where we finished last season 
next season. So we need we need the ownership shit to be sorted out ASAP in order for us to get over the line. In my humble opinion, we need that still to be sorted out ASAP. So I really am hoping that that happens sooner rather than later. I really am hoping that happens sooner rather than later. Then another thing to quickly mention that I thought would be funny to see. Have you ever seen all the stuff happening with Joe Rogan and this flipping um doctor called what's his name? Peter Hotez. It's been pretty wild to see because for the most part, Rogan never really replies to anybody online. He rarely goes back and forth with people. And he's probably the only person that I legitimately believe, um, a prominent person out there who says, oh, I don't read comments. I legitimately believe that he doesn't because if you have heard or seen the way comedians react to Rogan, how they jump over the flipping table to suck him off at every given opportunity, how some people, especially the Brian Cans, and Brendan Schultz of this world, they go on their own podcast and they suck him off. So you can only imagine how it must be with strangers. So I wouldn't be surprised if Rogan does go out of his way to protect his energies and to make sure that he kind of avoids coming into contact with people that are going to either suck him dry or just get engage him in nonsensical conversations. So when he does say he doesn't read comments, I'm definitely um you know one person that kind of believes him but for some reason i guess the covid thing the vaccination thing is something that's still having a grip on americans to this day anti-vaxxers are still a thing which is odd because i would have thought anti-vaxxers would have kind of died out because we've all kind of gone back to living our normal lives but i guess the anti-vaxxer community are very um you know are very active over the united states and rogan and this guy called pia hotez got into a bit of a back and forth because of rogan's interview with um robert kennedy uh, jr on his podcast recently where he is essentially a covid19 skeptic um maybe people are talking conspiracy theorists but he had some very interesting things to say about a vaccine um and about everything else concerning covid and i would imagine nowadays especially with how everything has kind of played out that people would be more receptive to like the alternative point of view because we know for the most part um that we were so we were sold, you know, we were sold down a river when it comes to COVID, when it comes to lockdown, when it comes to face masks, right? We were kind of given the impression that it was one thing when really it was all about control, it was all about compliance, and it was really um, wasn't about kind of doing the best um, for the populace or for the, you know, country overall. It was more so to kind of just to, um, you know, to kind of line the pockets of whoever was in charge at that moment. So you would imagine nowadays people would be a little bit more receptive to that kind of conversation, but for some reason, but for some reason they're not. For some reason, still people have this weird idea about COVID and stuff that they don't really want to hear regular people online speaking about it. They just want to defer to the experts, but the experts were the ones that were compromised. Mad, mad, mad. Anyway, but anyway, um, the back and forth between Rogan and this guy called Pierre Hotez reached fever pitch when allegedly, according to the Washington Post, um, he now says anti-vaxxers stalked him and kind of came to his house, <laughs> which I think is either blown out of proportion or it's another attempt at the mainstream media to try and paint Rogan fans as these, you know, jujitsu loving sycophants that they would go to this guy's house and essentially try and accost him in front of his wife and children and stuff, which is a little bit much. But this headline courtesy of watching the post is as follows. The vaccine scientist says anti-vaxxers stalked him after Joe Rogan challenge. Um, so it says as follows. The vaccine scientist says anti-vax activists stalked him at his home on Sunday um, after Joe Rogan and others, including Twitter boss Elon Musk, challenged the scientists to debate robert f kennedy jr an anti-vaccine proponent and democrat um, presidential candidate over the vaccine misinformation so him and peter hotez and um joe rogan go back or uh, back and forth on instant on twitter joe rogan propositions him and says hey i'll offer you i think a five one hundred thousand to your charity of choice if you would come on my podcast and debate um robert kennedy jr um, with no time limit regarding the COVID vaccine. And now for whatever reason, this Peter Hotel's guy bitched out and said he didn't want to do it. But that's essentially the kind of whole premise of the conversation. And then I think Mark Cuban also jumped in. It was a very, very bizarre conversation to have, to say the least. But um, essentially, it was a pretty good deal. I would say if he was that Peter Hotel's guy, if he legitimately thought Robert F. Kennedy was spreading misinformation, the fact that he's now running for president and he's had such a viral and very popular episode on Rogan, it would have been the perfect place to kind of signal boost Peter Hotel is his you know mantra and what he's trying to preach but for whatever reason he doesn't want to debate people so he kind of bitched out on that one and now he's trying to blame rogan fans for coming to his house which is crazy because i think anti-vaxxer fans aren't all rogan fans they probably just are a separate contingent of people but anyway it continues <clears throat> 
It says Peter Hotez, a Houston-based scientist and pediatrician in global health, vaccinology, and uh, neglected topical disease control, spent much of the pandemic debunking misinformation spread online about COVID-19 and the vaccines targeting the coronavirus. He was also part of the Nobel Prize nominated team of scientists who created an affordable, easy-to-make coronavirus vaccine. Um, Hotez criticized Rogan over the weekend as an awful um, for hosting Kennedy, one of the country's leading anti-vaccine advocates, who has peddled false claims linking vaccines seems to autism on rogan's widely popular podcast last week sorry but if you're at this point so many you know a couple of years since you know the height of the pandemic and you are gonna get influenced by some random presidential candidate after the fact going on a show telling you about the risk involved in the vaccine then you know you're always going to be subset subset um subject to somebody flipping duping you if this is the case the fact that you can't have even conversations um you know speaking about it on the other side of things and being skeptical is ridiculous really you don't need to believe these people you don't need to take their advice as gospel but saying that they can't speak or they can't have a conversation or they shouldn't be you know debated and not worthy of debate is really bizarre it continues says in response Rogan publicly challenged the vaccine scientists to debate kennedy in a tweet saturday that has now been viewed more than 50 million times rogan said he'd give one hundred thousand to charity of Hotel's choice if you're willing to debate him on my show with no time limit the then billionaire claimed that he'd give more money and vaccine skeptics piled on among them was musk who tweeted that Hotel was afraid of public debate but Hotel said that he was not prepared for what unfolded on sunday when anti-vaccine activists showed up at his house to harass him taunt and confront him about rogan's challenge to debate kennedy he tweeted that he was stalked in front of my house by a couple of anti-vaxxers taunting me to debate so a couple of rogue losers turned up to his house and he's making it seem like the whole of the gre subreddit was there <clears throat> sorry an interview on monday Hotel said him and his wife <clears throat> sorry um, were re returning with a cake for Father's Day. See, he's always eating shit, this guy, isn't he? He's proud of eating fast food, being a pediatrician and a doctor in general. And then he's also buying himself a cake for Father's Day. Like, put the cake down, put down the hot wings and go for a run, mate. Accosted me when I was walking in my house. He said he shoved the cell phone camera in my face and asked me if I would debate RFK and Rogan. They were clearly lying in wait. Um, he said, it's very sad. All we were trying to do is get cake for Father's Day. <laughs> he added the the accident at the anti-vaccine attacks usually come um, in waves of aggression, and this is one that as bad has been in the last twenty years. A spokesperson for Spotify, the streaming platform that hosts Rogan, said did not respond for comment. Blah de blah blah blah. So clearly a bit of a crazy issue. It still surprises me that COVID nineteen or the vaccine in general, the pandemic, has still it's still like a topic of discussion for some people um i've just kind of permanently moved on from it it was such a troubling and awful time that i've kind of you know deleted it into the recesses of my brain but there's some people that are really really still hung up on it and i think for rogan being a comedian and having his entire livelihood essentially taken away from him despite having all the money in the world to do whatever he wanted but still not able to do it maybe has left some permanent scars that he's still not kind of over in the mean in, in the grand scheme of things and also like i said it was the one time that i felt like the media was legitimately trying to cancel him when he was taking that ivermectin stuff so maybe he still feels a little bit away about that as well but regardless of the fact um it was fine to see rogan go back and forth with somebody online because you rarely if ever see it so clearly clearly that guy was pissed off then I want to quickly mention um this rave that I went to over the weekend. I went to go see Freddie K um perform over there at E1 um for E1 Presents, as you can see here via the screen. Um E1 I felt like have a pretty decent booking team in-house that does a good job of putting together these lineups that are very kind of Berlin friendly. Um I think for a lot of these people, yeah, unless you're out there in Germany or you're out there in parts of Europe, you're not gonna see them play on a regular basis, but they do have a bit of a cult following. Um there are people that a lot of people in the scene kind of feel like are pushing the sound forward and essentially you know uh, providing a path for themselves to be part of the new legends part of the new flipping leading pack of artists coming through and you obviously got the likes of a veteran like a freddie k but people like geyser dj gigolo or gazon and mcrt are definitely guys and girls that you would see on that channel called whore over there in berlin that does a good job of highlighting some of the talent out there so when they get these guys over there i really do like it and i do like the fact that it's just an e1 present show because a lot of clubs here in london for the most part rely 
rely on promoters to essentially bring people um, to the club. Um, maybe you have your own community, you have your own clique of people that kind of come. But the fact that the club itself takes a risk to book these people and have them play, I feel like is a really, really cool thing to see and to kind of see here when you kind of go. So um, the good thing about E1 as well is that it's not too far from where I live. So I can go in there and check it out. I can go down a quick little half an hour bike ride that kind of makes it easy to go and hang out and chill. I decided to pop over there. And my main goal was to see MCRT, Organzo, Gigalo and Freddie K. In the end, I only got to see two, which was Agazon and Freddie K. Agazon, I think, played, if I'm not mistaken, from about 12 to about two. For some reason, there wasn't any set list, which is annoying. Um, for some reason, London clubs hate to put out um, set lists of how long or when somebody is playing. Um, I think the idea behind it is that they want everyone to stay and just drink and spend a lot of money so they'd rather not let you know so that you can stay as long as possible but it's annoying for a punter like myself who just wants to go and see you just perform like I'm going to see a band so I had to kind of just wait it out but um, according to the splits I'm pretty sure when I walked in I saw Orgazon playing um, for a while and then Freddie came, came after the fact so I saw a bit of those two together and then when I was in the black studio for a little bit I did see a little bit of DJ no I I think I saw a little bit of, of Alcatraz. I didn't see anybody else when I was out there really. So that was pretty decent to go and check out. Now the plan was that I was going to go use my little new Canon Cybershot type of camera it's a really old one from the early 2000s with like eight megapixels on it but the whole idea behind it was i wanted to film some footage similar to what you'd see from like you know these kids nowadays who are basically filming lo-fi type of videos on old um cyber shop kind of digital camera type of things um but unfortunately i forgot that the video portion of these cameras aren't the greatest so they take pretty good pictures they kind of remind me of the old days of like you know uh cobra snake um flash you know flash photography pictures like terry richardson style but the videos aren't the greatest especially the sound so i'm not too sure if the sound of the clip that i'm going to play you is because i put my big fat thumb over the microphone or if the microphone itself is absolutely shoddy and wasn't picking up the sound properly but either way the quality isn't the greatest but you'll get to see and feel the view of where i was when i was in the club itself so this is a clip of you know a, a random arrangement of clips taken from the night out featuring orgazon and freddie k at flippin e1 in london 17 over the six <laughs> It sounds muffled. It sounds a little bit like, you remember there was always that guy in your area who had like a souped up Honda Civic or something and he put a flipping crazy subwoofer in it or something and he'd be like, boom, boom. you could barely hear the lyrics of the song. It'd just be like, just, it'd sound like a fucking demon. Do you know what I mean? I'm throwing up or something. This is what it kind of sounds like. <laughs> So, so again, I don't know if this is the camera or if this is my fat thumb over the microphone, but you get a kind of gist of the overall night and me kind of being in there. Um, I'll just scrub a little bit forward again so I can see some other bits here. I think there's a bit here that features a bit of Freddie K. Let's see if I can get that bit there. Uh, I think it might be around here. Yeah, maybe around here. Maybe around here is when Freddie K came on. I'm not too sure. Let me see. I think this is when the applause happens, isn't it? Around here. Loads of dudes, by the way. Loads and loads of dudes. <laughs> Okay, I, I, I now I don't think it's the mic. I don't think it's my fat farm. I think it might be the mic, because when the bass wasn't kicking in there of the song, it sounded pretty decent. You could hear the claps. 
I could hear people speaking. It wasn't muffled. But as soon as the bass hits the microphone, it just goes absolutely crazy. But that's a bit of my footage I've got on there. I've got to leave it up there on my site anyway, regardless. But yeah, the night itself was fairly decent. Like I said, I only stayed there for a few hours. Um, I had the ability to see a couple of those guys play. Um, if anything, I'd say I feel like Freddie K is a little bit overrated. I feel like the legend around Freddie K has been mostly created around the stuff that he's done at Berkheim, playing the closing sets there. And the fact that he seems like a really cool dude. He has his radio show that he does. He has a cool little community of people that listen to that. Um, he engages with them really well, merch, loads of vinyl, and just seems to be a generally like a good dude, um, which is kind of says a lot because a lot of Berkheim guys or the Berlin guys in general, DJ wise, can be a little bit up there and ask. But the fact that he's you know a veteran in the game seen everything but still kind of has a good attitude about things is why people basically like him but i feel like his dj sets kind of flat to deceive sometimes um i feel like he's not as great as people try to make it seem as but still enjoyed it no you know without exception but the definitely the standout was um this dj called orgazon i had a really good time listening to her play so i definitely would recommend you check them out if you are that way inclined you should definitely check them out if you're that way inclined and then i quickly went to mention this news courtesy again of variety regarding the one and only megan markle and prince harry um it looks like their spotify deal is over now again i don't know what this means about the overall market or industry for podcasts i said previously before um with the news that's kind of been rumbling out there that spotify aren't going to renew rogan's show and there's a few other things that they've cancelled it seems like the platforms or these digital streaming platforms have finally realized that they maybe have they may be overpaid for talent so even though rogan probably brought a lot to them spotify you know i think they signed rogan for like what 300 million for like a six-year deal licensing only it's still probably a little bit too much even if he did bring a lot of people over there like myself right i didn't have a spotify premium account before rogan joined spotify and only got it because of him but then now i stayed listening to the music because the, po the spotify podcast experience is so awful but this particular case is interesting because it looks like they may they, they their deal mostly ended because Prince Harry and Meghan Markle didn't deliver what they promised like they only delivered one show and I think it was one show once a month but everything else they were meant to deliver in terms of a horde a whole kind of range of shows whatever didn't never really materialize so I'm not really sure if this is because the deal wasn't good they got lazy they pocket the money it was a scam who knows but interesting results regardless so it says Spotify exclusive podcast deal with Prince Harry and Meghan Markle has come to an end with the couple having delivered just one show under the agreement the Spotify arch will audio the couple's audio podcasting shingle said on thursday the joint statement that they are ending their pact says spotify archwell have mutually agreed to part ways and are proud to the series they made together according to a source familiar with the situation prince harry and mega marco have wanted to move away from the exclusive podcast distribution um, to find a new home for their audio projects i was actually surprised that they decided to jump on board and sign their exclusive deal anyway it obviously made sense because they wanted to fucking get the money up front but it would have been better to kind of shop their show around or to have it, you know, signed on exclusively for different platforms and stations as opposed to having an overall deal, you would assume. But hey, it continues. It says, another source said that Spotify expected more content from Archwell, noting that the earlier three years after inking the pact that they delivered only one series, essentially putting the overall deal in limbo. The show is Markle's archetypes in which he deconstructs the history of social stereotypes about women, while which premiered on August 20, 2022 um, and hit number one on the Apple charts in multiple countries. Archwell Audio first inked to the exclusive podcast packed through the Spotify in a 2020 in the deal worth more than 20 million. 20 million they got for it and they only delivered one show once a month. Crazy. The Wall Street Journal reported the company's mission is to produce programming that uplifts, entertains audiences around the world as well as spotlights diverse perspectives and voices and builds community through, stand, through shared experience and narratives and values. So clearly something happened and went amiss. I personally think they just probably overpaid for them. I wonder if this has any inkling on what's happening with streaming at the moment. I've mentioned before the SQC deal with Kick was crazy big, right? 100 million. I wonder if it's like the same thing is going to happen with those streaming platforms. They're going to find out that they most likely, that they most likely, um, you know, uh, overpaid for some of their flipping podcast shows that they had on, which is what led to all this flipping craziness that occurred so not surprising in the slightest really not surprising slightest because no one else was really checking for them it kind of is what it is 
Let's actually quickly check out and see what's going on. If there's flipping Louis Vuitton um, shows on at the moment, it shouldn't be. I was, I'd be surprised if it is on because, you know, fashion shows never start on time. Uh, as I can see here, courtesy of my screen, it shows that it's not currently on the moment. It's seems like so. Obviously, we have to wait until that kind of goes through. Let's quickly refresh the screen and see. But I'm pretty sure this is going to start very, very, very late. So anybody think it's going to start on time, you are probably mistaken. But let's see. I'm going to give the screen a quick refresh. Let's see what's happening. But I think it's going to be starting late, to be honest, because most shows never start on time, especially live stream. It just takes a while to kind of get things done and whatnot, especially being the first show. Yes, yeah, it's still waiting now. So we have to kind of wait and see when that eventually does come on. But we will be covering it and checking it out live in response as it comes along. Do not worry about nothing. Do not worry about nothing. So moving on from that one, let's actually check actually and talk about some of the stuff that's been happening since the flipping show um most of you have probably known um pharrell obviously has taken over um creative director role over there at louis vuitton men's and his first show is going to be coming up um in a few minutes so i'm going to be covering that on the channel of course but the hub hullabaloo around it has been pretty interesting to see i for one have been very skeptical of the appointment um i thought it was a bit of an odd choice to make especially when you consider the amount of talent that's out there with the likes of grace wells bonner martin rose names being floated around there and plenty others there are loads of people out there who currently are designing at very high levels who could actually fill those shoes up very easily and provide a very interesting perspective on louis vuitton connect with the youth and just be a really good person to kind of take the reins from the legend that was virgil abloh right i think that would be a really good option to do but of course, the people that work in these companies at LVMH and stuff are usually a lot more smarter than we are. So they know, you know, what that company needs. They know what certain brands need. They know um, who to kind of approach for certain things. They go to certain people for certain stuff. They know who's kind of tapped in with the youth. They kind of have their finger on a pulse, right? They don't get paid the big bucks or nothing. They really do know what to deal with. So when the Pharrell appointment was made, it was so out of the, it was so kind of um, out of the blue, so out of left field that it kind of made me think, you know what? There's probably some method to this madness. There probably is some real genius around this decision to put you know to hire somebody like afro williams because my first concern with it was that he's not really a designer in a conventional sense even though he co-founded billionaire boys club and ice cream and whatever it may be i always saw him more as a kind of um tastemaker who had the ability to design the odd product here and there you know he's shown over the years that he can you know put together an extensively beautiful um you know jewelry collection he's done some great work in terms of sunglasses he's done some great work in terms of capsule collections but in terms of putting together a full runway show with you know 50 plus looks um doing you know maybe four shows per year um all this type of stuff i would have thought it would be very challenging someone to have to do that but then I also think back to the time of me watching a random clip of Karl Lagerfeld from before when he was a live R.I.P. to a legend where he's sitting in his studio somewhere, um, you know, working on stuff with Chanel and he just sits there and sketches stuff, hands it to somebody in the atelier and they essentially mock up a sample for him to check out, and, you know, and fill in his hands. So clearly this is a thing that happens a lot in these kind of luxury houses where they have these in-house people who work there who can essentially take your vision, take your idea and materialize it into a real thing. So essentially, you don't actually need to have any knowledge of pattern cutting, any knowledge of sewing, any knowledge of you know design at all. As long as you've got cool ideas and you're willing to collaborate with your team, you can essentially put together a very coherent collection in a very short space of time. So that made me think, you know what, maybe there is some Maybe there is some flipping um, information there that I should maybe be absorbing. Then I decided to read these new articles that came out of Rap Pharrell, and they really do paint an interesting picture about the guy and his approach to it. The first article is courtesy of New York Times. It says Pharrell Williams, Louis Vuitton, New Don. And in this particular article, you get the feeling that Pharrell kind of knows that he's coming into this as a somewhat of a novice, and he's purposely decided to surround himself with some really interesting and key players who are going to be essentially helping him to kind of, you know, tell the story of Louis Vuitton in a very coherent way. The first thing that was interesting about this article was that he mentioned that he originally was pushing Nigo to get the job in front of him. 
he actually didn't want the job. He actually assumed when um, Alexander Arno was calling him that he was calling him for recommendations of who he should hire. He didn't know that he was actually calling him for, for him to take the job at Louis Vuitton, which is interesting because I think at the time, Nigo was already at Kenzo and he's already doing a great job there and Kenzo is already at LVMH brand, so it didn't make sense. So that was the same thing. Then I also learned that he's got the the owner of a cactus plant flea market i forgot her name she's helping um to do something there let's actually yeah, there we go so it says here um that he's had this quote, interesting quote he said here over the past several weeks he's had a crash course in design how to run a studio how to manage a team of 40 to 50 people and how to take criticism and work with people at the top because you know it's a blend of creativity and also running a business says matthew henson who's been the personal stylist for mr williams for the last couple of years and if you're not familiar i'm pretty sure matthew henson used to work with asap rocky too for a bit i'm not sure if he's still uh, a stylist for him so he's there and it continues to says Mr. Henson is also styling the show along with Cynthia Liu, Mr. Williams' former assistant, who is now the quiet powerhouse of the idiocentric streetwear and with her own brand, Cactus Plant Flea Market. So clearly, Pharrell's come into this with an idea that he needs as much help as possible to kind of put his, you know, his ideas on, out there on the runway, which has been quite cool to see. Um, and I also like the idea that he's tapping into the resources they have available and essentially using the team that's already there to kind of bring his ideas to life. As the next quote says... It says when Mr. Williams walks through the studios here, um, he's in awe of the specialized design teams appears genuine. He says, presto, things get turned around so fast. I've had more resources than I've ever had in my entire life. They don't miss like that at all. None, nobody, right? And this this goes back to what I've always said before. Like I always feel like for whatever reason, the fashion industry does a really bad job of lionizing people, of making out as if like every designer out there is like Alexander McQueen, essentially, you know, researching every single theme, cutting, drawing, you know, um, uh, tailoring, whatever, sewing every little piece. But actually what actually is kind of happening, especially at the highest levels is that these houses have already people that could do that side of things for you. So they get the celebrity person, the person that's got their finger on the post to come in and essentially lead the ship as a quintessential creative director where they kind of have, you know maybe the overarching theme in mind they can maybe add some final touches or they could just be the conductor that just makes sure everybody's in tune but this idea that it's just a one lone kind of genius person on their own is really really redacted because in the fast-paced fashion industry nowadays you kind of do need a all-star team to bring these visions to life it continues again here it says there was something that he was prepared for in part by a conversation he had with virgil abler it says but for real williams um after abler was hired uh, for the same job in 2018 in the three years at the helm of louis vuitton men's before his sudden death in 2021 mr Ab abler upended the ideas about how luxury houses might function and that story it might be able to tell in a dialogue with those who had long been held at arm's length from luxury fashion just outside the atelier hangs the crucial defining image from miss abler's first ad campaign for louis Vuitton, a black toddler draped in a Wizard of Oz themed sweater, one of Abler's first campaign pieces. Um, Mr. Williams recalled Mr. Abler's awe at the same scale of the efficiency of the of the atelier. Um, before Williams said, Virgil would tell, always talk about how they were, how they would never say no, which they don't. So that's a responsibility not to abuse them. Mr. Williams is now second consecutive black American in a role. He says, over here, they lift us up. They appreciate what we do. They see the talent of what we have. So that's a really cool thing about it. It's like, you know, Pharrell and Virgil had a close relationship when they were when he was alive. So the fact that he's been given this job is a really cool little nod to that. And also the continuation of it being like a black voice behind this brand, um, a black cultural voice in the shape of Pharrell and what he's done in music and beyond is really incredible to see also. So I think this story definitely needed to be told even if it is just a couple of seasons like if and if he does you know put out a dud which i don't think he will um i feel like from what we've seen so far of the samples and the little kind of you know bits here and there it seems like he's going for the tried and true method of putting out like staple wardrobe pieces that every man would kind of want and then kind of giving it a louis vuitton sort of spin He's not like he's trying to reinvent the wheel or anything. He's just approaching it from a consumer consumer's point of view, it kind of feels like. So I don't think he's going to be putting out a dud. But even if he does put out a dud, um, I think it's important just to kind of keep that legacy of that story of Black Voices, type, you know, telling the story through the amplified um, platform that is Louis Vuitton. 
Um, it continues here, it says here, the Arno family, he said, understands how crucial the black American dollar and aesthetic has been for growth and the cashier of Louis Vuitton. 100%, they know it. We, we've had some conversations about how important the community is to them and how being supported to them is natural and a, pre and a prerequisite. He said he's looking to expand the house's brand. This is what I really like about this though. He's looking to expand the brand ambassador program beyond the usual musicians and actors to black academic, black authors, black astrophysicists, and even black bass fish champion i love stuff like this they have to be supportive of the culture because of the culture contributes to the bottom line which is something that a lot of these brands don't really kind of have in mind really for some odd reason um and then another section here says a new humility there are some things that mr Abler, sorry mr williams will simply not say in public settings at least he speaks with the deliberateness of somebody who wants no words to be misinterpreted his sunglasses stay on i need something for myself rhetorically he returns to familiar narratives and motives the seismic changes in his life every 10 years the eternal quest to learning and the continuing practice of gratitude um pusha t says he never speaks the truth of himself and i hate it said pusha t it's my pet peeve about him he knows he's great at things but he wants to um he wants that to walk him through the door versus him saying hey guys come on let's get me through he's kind of like the opposite of kanye in it kanye wants you to know the work is good but he also wants you to hear him say he knows the work is good whereas you know Pharrell just lets it speak for himself. Um, squint hard though, and you may see the faintest flickers of the mid 2000s Pharrell Williams, a more boisterous, boasty person, a whiff of the old self propped up on the video of Mr. Williams posted in late January backstage at the Kento show with Nigo when he knew he was on the verge of signing the contract. You know what rhymes with 2023? Money tree um <laughs> he said into his phone camera nodding intensely he didn't lick his lips um but he might as well have when the appointment was announced Sider created the longtime acolyte and style guru of his own right facetime mr williams he just has this look and is given he just has this look that he gives me where he kind of goes yeah i did that he didn't say anything tyler said and then he gave me the praying hands <laughs> you gotta love for real um, on his 2006 mixtape in my mind a dizzying display of Dysonian ostination a peacock at the peak of his peacock in Miss Williams wrapped we wanted this life we salivated it like wolves um, blow a hundred grand on LV leather goods Miss Williams almost flinched at the memory I'm very I was greasy on that now he said you promise I will love you I promise you I love being humble he said but luxury fashion is not a business built in humility and Miss Williams is keen to make a splash the theme of his show um Miss Williams said it will be about lovers the first inkling of this vision emerged in April at the Virginia Festival where Williams organized something called something in the water blah 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 um but the thing the quote that i love the best is this one there's a quote here somewhere right where he's spoken about julia and i thought that was one of the best quotes i've freaking heard of him say during his whole promo press tour that he's doing let's see if i can find it uh julia is this a julia how you spell it is that how you spell it julia uh oh no i think it's like a actually maybe central let's see there you go yeah um so here we go um this is the thing i curse of the vogue article right i thought this is the best flipping quote or interview from me he says here the question says as follows but there were there, but there are lovers there are sometimes also haters after you got appointed a lot of people were criticizing the decision because you didn't go to fashion school for our reply first of all of course people are going to say that i didn't go to central st martin's but you know i didn't go to juliet either to study music and i've done all right <laughs> <laughs> understatement of the year i've done all right as black people on, on this planet we are used to that telling us what to do or what you cannot do but you can't tell the universe what's going to be written you can work with it co-inspire and co-create but you can't tell the universe what's going to be so for me it's always like y'all are surprised well i'm surprised too but i'm going to show this to you better than i'm going to explain it to you and that was a perfect answer um, to kind of, you know, um, go against some of the narrative out there that he shouldn't be given a job based on his lack of experience. Um, I would say my kind of pushback was it mostly just because of we've never actually seen him put together a full collection. Less so about his actual education and going to Central St. Martin's because I don't think 
you know, for all the benefits of Central Street Mines, I don't think actually going to Central Street Mines to study fashion will prepare you to be the creative director of any luxury fashion house because you, you know, you're a student. You're not looking at it from a business point of view. It's no real life experience that you're kind of picking up from, you know, learning and, you know, how to do, how to be a good designer in Flipping University. It doesn't really prepare you for the business side of being a creative director of a big luxury house somewhere and the pressures that come with it. But if you're Pharrell and you've been playing at the front line, on major stages for the majority of your life even if you haven't been doing full collections the pressure is nothing really foreign to you um the platform itself is something that you already kind of are familiar with especially in terms of not sitting there designing things all those things kind of make a lot of sense so i could definitely understand um where he's coming from with that regard so i thought that answer was absolutely perfect and like i've said just checking out some little clips and so far that we've seen um we've got this amazing little bag that he's going to be featuring i think he mentioned actually um that he wants this bag to be made in loads of really bright and exuberant colors i think the idea behind it he was saying that how um most likely they're going to be faked and they're going to be sold on canal street um but he would rather have louis vuitton make actually really good colors so that customers want to buy them because I think he said most of the time people buy fakes of these Louis Vuitton bags because you can't actually get bright colors or interesting colors in the shop. You can only get really boring ones. So they will go out and buy a, a far more cheaper bag that has the look but has a better color that kind of matches their vibe than just buy one for the retail price that's a fucking avocado green. So he's going to make these in bright colors. I love the addition of the strap on this bag because it turns it immediately into a very feminine bag, into a very easy to wear satchel type bag that can be worn by dudes um in this picture here we've got a guy wearing a leather m65 type jacket with the camo digi you know print that he has now on some of his stuff another picture here we have um him wearing a motorbike jacket you would call it um with some of those jeans that he likes with the kind of flared bottom if i was being super critical i'd say this look with the sort of like flared bottom is kind of done kind of redundant um it may be something he should have done maybe a couple of years ago so but he can maybe make it right who knows let's see what happens when it goes forward and we've got another image here again of the uh, biker jacket that he's made obviously for louis vuitton with what i think is a print on it somewhere uh louis vuitton labels um on the zips and some of the snap buttons as well so it's clearly he's doing something that is a bit more you know casual in terms of what he's approaching i think it's going to be a lot of staples i think we're going to see a lot of basketball jackets i think we're going to see a lot of jerseys a lot of denim jackets a lot of m65s a lot of hoodies like staples that you would assume you'd wear in your wardrobe we're going to see those in the runway um and as opposed to him trying to reinvent the wheel and create whole entire different shapes i think he's going to go at it and approach it as just okay let me make my own version of this through the lens of louis vuitton that's what i think we're going to see going forward anyway regarding his collection so it's not going to be super expansive the glasses he's wearing now at the moment i think they're not even louis vuitton i think they're custom ones that he may be i don't know if they're chanel or something i forgot what they are but i remember him having them for a while i don't think they're louis vuitton um, maybe i'm mistaken they might be but i do remember him having a similar type of glasses beforehand that he got kind of custom made by somebody else so interested to see what happens with those going forward um and then of course we've got more detailing here again on the m65 type jacket that looks like it's been you know uh made of the same kind of was it the print that you would assume that you'd see on some of the other jackets that he obviously puts together so clearly there's a concerted effort to put this shit together and make it look a certain way that's the best thing that i do like about this so let's see how that goes and how it kind of pushes forward um, we can kind of go back here again to the interview. It says, you didn't pay for that course at fashion school, but you were pretty close to Karl Lagerfeld and you spoke a lot. Have you taken any learnings um, from him? He said, of course, this is the orchestra of a different sort and you're dealing with many different sections of the orchestra and there's loads of typography, sorry, loads of topography in the collection, just like there is in a composition. We just have to super dialed in into that zoom in and zoom out perspective. That's equally, so that's especially important for this first collection because I'm also establishing the key components, the codes, the specific details from the rivets to the buttons and the zippers all the way to the, all the way to the sizes and big size shapes um and then you got this really great picture of him um on the table somewhere talking to somebody in the team with a richard millie on one one on one wrist 
where it really corners in on his wedding band. It's kind of done instead of being like a flat wedding band, it's kind of rounded, which looks really cool. And then he's also got a fucking Louis Vuitton um, cup holder or cup warmer, whatever it was called. And then there's also a gold straw that's obviously made from Louis Vuitton. Also, it's a fucking good little flex here to see. So let's see how that kind of continues. The interview goes on. It says it's, it's, it's the opening track of an album, but we referred it later to a recording. Although that's probably a clumsy metaphor. He says, no, it's a great metaphor. It's absolutely construct. Um, he says, before you came through the doors in February, what was your perception of Louis Vuitton? Pharrell says, it's always been the, the highest regard. It was from this moment that I met Mark Jacobs in 2003 and he asked me about my sunglasses at 57th Street store and then asked me if I wanted to make some I was like whoa that's amazing but Nico designed these and I'm gonna bring him as well that was uh that was the first time someone from my ilk was trying to be inventive of the same things um Mark really opened the door and the Arnolds were already there okay fair play to him then a lot of kinship between Nico and Flipping Pharrell as well they've been through the mud together um it's funny because he still doesn't speak any English Nico so I wonder how they communicate anyway he says it continues says um when you were just at Lakers guest girl Elvin Williams I show in La in Lego Magori, have you been talking to the counterpart at Louis Vuitton Mental Studio? Lucas is a legend, and yes, we've kicked it here and there. So my theory was a bit different regarding the whole Nicholas guest girl thing. I was thinking if I was Nicholas guest girl, I'd be a little bit annoyed that Pharrell's first campaign for Louis Vuitton Mens is him propping up um, Rihanna, um, who is obviously a woman. Um, and using her as a muse when maybe she should be used for, you know, what they're doing over the Max Mara. So she's been not being used as a muse and she's there at the show as well. So I wonder what the expression is for that's going to come. Um, it continues. It says, is your music going to be the soundtrack? It says, I'm, I'm not going to break it to you, but yes, I'm, we said it's all emotional. The music is very emotional, you know. Something has happened in your life in the humble, so it must be like that. So I'm assuming we might even see a premiere of a new song we haven't heard before. Maybe we might hear a premiere of that new Pusha T song that's meant to come out on Friday. Pusha T's got a song on Friday that's meant to be coming out. It's meant to be going out with his enemies. So maybe we might hear a Pusha T song played uh, during the show um, sometime later today. So let's see how that happens and if that plays out the way it's going to play out. That might be an actual thing, actually. So let's see if that is the case. Let's see if that is the case. It continues here again. In the oh, yeah, like I said, um, if I was Nicholas Gesquet, I'll be a little bit annoyed with this because it's meant to be Louis Vuitton men's and then Pharrell's first campaign. Um, he then, you know, has Rihanna, one of the most famous and fashionable women in the, in the scene, front and center for his campaign. It feels like, you know, Pharrell's kind of stepping on Nicholas Gesquet's toes. And it wouldn't surprise me if in a real Game of Thrones succession style ploy, Louis, LBMH kind of brought him in to do this have his first campaign be Rihanna and then have him slowly but surely uh, push Guest Gear out and then have Louis Vuitton, you know, Louis Vuitton um, be one thing under like a unified umbrella as opposed to it being men and women. That might be a situation we might see going forward. Who knows? Um, but, you know, that could be the case. It continues here because the thing, the show's still not on yet. I'm checking here on my phone, actually see if it's on. It still hasn't started yet. Of course it hasn't started. <laughs> it's never going to start on time fashion shows are always 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 late um continuing on with the interview or oh, no interview's finished here but we've got some pictures of uh pharrell here with alexander arno the son who was um formerly the head of fucking tiffany's no formerly the head of ramoa then tiffany's like this is the the height of nepotism he's got zero source as well but he seems to always have a good smile on his face and happy about life so that's a good place to be but he got to you know lead fucking Ramoa for a bit was responsible for all those cool amazing suitcases they did most you know most memorable being the Louvre, the Virgil one that he did that was see-through then he went over to Tiffany's did the Air Force One that was absolutely horrible um and then um you know uh just living life so enjoy him and there's an old picture here of Pharrell and Nigo back in the day in 2005 doing what they do best you know flossed out with the jewelry and shit I remember this fucking hoodie the amount of fights that it created around it back in the day the trucker hats the fights they created I, f I still think to this day no one makes better shaped trucker hats than Bape did back in the day the, the, sh the shape of them was absolutely sublime you could wear them all the way down you could have them perched up on top of your head wear them backwards like they, they retained their shape for a long time 
doesn't get the props he deserves, nigga, for that era, man. Because if it happened nowadays, legitimately, that guy was like, he's already a legend anyway, but he'd be a far bigger legend. And maybe also, so maybe the language barrier. Maybe if he was actually um, able to speak English confidently, because I think he probably can be, just probably shy, like most foreign people are. Um, it would be pretty sick to kind of see him do that, to be fair, going forward. Do you know what I mean? Because he'd be a far bigger legend than he is now if that was the case. Um, so big up Pharrell, big up Nigo, going back again over some pictures here. You got a picture here from Pharrell when he was here in London for a bit. Um, I forgot what he was here doing, actually. I think he had a dinner with a few um, UK people, I remember. But maybe this, what he's wearing here, this this leather romper thing. Oh, no, it's not a romper. It's a leather, it's a leather vest. Look, it looks like a leather blazer with some leather trousers. Maybe that's part of the Louis Vuitton collection also. Not really too sure. Um, going forward there, we've got some more pictures of him um here as well looking great and then i think i went to mention the thing about the bag if, if i could see it here the article about the bag let's see if i can find it because i thought yeah there we go so um here he is we're talking about this bag here that's featured called the what's it called it's called the speedy bag right so i think i mentioned it to you beforehand this bag here that he's wearing the speedy bag that's also featured in one of these little pictures that i have here somewhere that this bag here he's talking about this on the new york times interview um he says um well it says here it featured a pregnant rihanna clutching multiple louis vuitton speedy bags in primary colors one of the first playful tweaks mr williams is bringing to the company's heritage the speedy one of louis vuitton's most recognizable bag designs dates 1930 and resembles the doctor's bag and i think the key word to point out here the key word that might give us a hint of what's to come is playful tweaks there's no reinventing of the wheel no going crazy and trying to create new silhouettes um you know new fabrication r crazy r d it's mostly just playful tweaks so taking some staples um of really what they do well or what's in a man's wardrobe and trying to um you know tell that story through the prism um of what pharrell's about and stuff so that's what we're gonna probably get so it continues here said i'm creative designer from the perspective of a consumer he said i didn't go to st martin's but i definitely went to the stores and purchased and i know what i like and this is my main grab with show studio when i used to watch show studios um you know live show discussions and stuff one of the things that used to annoy me was that it always kind of came from the point of view of like real um pretentious people who don't really aren't in touch with the consumers people who are all, always looking at it from a super um uh, from a super heady designer point of view as opposed to what consumers who actually purchase this stuff on the regular would look at it as and I think that was one of the reasons why the show studio after a time kind of got a bit boring to watch because it all kind of sounded like a big echo chamber of people basically you know having a bit of a fashion gossip about who did what who did what when really the point of it should be hey if I don't like what you're doing I have to find something an approach that you do that's pretty cool that might help me out in terms of what I'm doing. That's what I'm thinking I might be doing. So maybe that's a thing, but who knows? But I do like this quote. This quote here is amazing. I didn't go to St. Martin's, but I definitely went to the stores and purchased. And I think, and I know what I like. And I think this is generally where this is going to go going forward. If you're a designer, you're probably better off if you're a kid going to St. Martin's to basically focus and do your own brand on the side as you're doing your degree at the same time. And then hope that the clout that you gain from building a successful brand from the ground up might put you in a position where you can get hired by one of these luxury houses because it makes a lot of sense to be completely fair. Like, you look at the stuff like Gap's doing, all that malarkey, like, you know, you're probably, they're probably better off trying to go and sign the likes of, you know, but something, whatever his name is, um, on there because you already come with some notoriety as opposed to plucking some designer out of the blue from nowhere to come and carry your brand. Your brand, it doesn't normally work out that way, really, for the most part. Either you're known inside the industry or you're kind of known from being outside around the house and just chilling there. That's my only thing to say about that one. Um, and then we continue here. What else it says? Ba, 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 ba. There's some conversation here about Sarah Andelman, the head of uh, Colette, who's also a big collaborator with Flipping, um, uh, what's his name? With Pharrell. Um, we've got two decades crash called conversation here about what he did to kind of get his way up there. That makes a lot of sense. 
um let's actually talk with this one it says almost since the beginning of his career in music mr williams had always found a way to incorporate and create fashion in 2003 he founded billionaire boys club with nigo perhaps his closest creative ally in style explaining the creative kinship between the two men nigo through an interpreter said the first time i went to Pharaoh's house in virginia when i looked in the wardrobe everything was the same as that i owned in 2003 mr williams met mark jacobs on the men's creative director of Vuitton, who invited him to collaborate on a pair of sunglasses. The result, known as the Millionaires, became hip-hop's luxury staple in mid-2000s and an updated version of any of them. Um, it continues, says, He was just so incredibly generous to give me that opportunity when nobody had ever given me an opportunity before. Uh, Mr. Williams said of Mr. Jacobs, the Millionaires were designed by Miss Williams and, and Nigo. There's something I didn't know though. I didn't know that the millionaire glasses were designed by Pharrell and Nigo. I just assumed it was a Pharrell thing. So again, goes back to my clear assumption that I think why I was nervous because I thought as if um, Pharrell's greatest work when it comes to building his boys club was something that he, that he did in close relationship with Nigo. And the moment Nigo stepped away from it and skate things stopped designing the graphics, being a boys club and ice cream kind of died a very, very slow death to the point where now, if you're wearing that sort of stuff nowadays, you're definitely on a troll team because those brands are absolutely dead out. So it's a bit of a shame to see that happening in real time. You know what I mean? Um, it continues here, it says, I thought the way forward for Louis Vuitton was to collaborate with other creators. Mr. Jacob says, it doesn't matter to me whether they were in music or in art or in other fashion, um, whether it was Stephen Sprouse or Takeshi Murakami or Pharrell, says Mr. Currency. Hello. But um, the, I thought that was a, it says that. Uh, but then when Williams arrived in Paris, Mr. Jacobs gave him uh, vouchers to shop in the store. He says, I was very nervous. Uh, sorry, I was very nouveau riche at the time. He says, tilting his head down and offering just a timest hint of knowing smirk. Other collaborators followed. Montclair, G-Star, Monyat, Reebok, and long partnership with Adidas and his assistant. Um, and almost a decade long affiliate with us, with Chanel and with us, Mr. Williamson's close friend, Carl Lagerfeld so a lot of flipping ties connected to this a lot of things that make a lot of sense for the appointment so it should be fairly decent but like I said there's a lot of pressure on Pharrell for this man there's a lot of pressure a lot of pressure um this is his basically his life work this should also kind of you know prove without any reasonable doubt can a consumer can an avid fan of this shit be put in a position to do this the last time we saw this happening was Kanye's first collection ever that one he paid for in Paris one of the criticisms I remember from the article was that oh just because you love fashion doesn't mean you should be doing it so I wonder if this is if this is going to be the same thing are people going to say the same thing about Pharrell just because you love clothes and you're super stylish doesn't mean you can make them the first person I think about is like Rihanna Rihanna's had many attempts to kind of make the Fenty thing a, a thing in terms of making it a show with all inclusive people and shit it just doesn't hit the same unfortunately um, people are probably still waiting for her to probably go back to whatever era that was but yeah let's see what happens about this um, let's see what goes on and let's see if this ends up being a really good collection to check out I'm still checking out on my phone to see if it started yet it still hasn't started <laughs> we're now almost half an hour late um, not surprising really fashion shows never ever 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 start on time so this shouldn't be a surprise for you guys if you've checked this out before um but yeah man let's see what the vibe is let's see what happens let's see what goes on i'm eager to see what the vibes are gonna be like um, what kind of music we're going to see, how it's going to be shot. So far, we've seen that I think it's going to be taking place on some bridge somewhere in Paris. Um, I feel like if you're there on that bridge, you're, if you live somewhere on either side of that bridge, you're going to be super pissed off because you're going to have to go a real long way around to kind of get to your house and shit. So uh, prayers to those people who are going to be affected negatively by a fashion show. But it also goes to show how connected or how kind of, you know, um, ingrained that shit is in Paris because they approved it with no questions asked man I, you know any other country they probably would have you know it would have been a big issue we'd have to apply for that stuff ages ago but they approved it and everything is all there to be fair so let's see what happens let's see what happens when it does start so far again nothing happening in there we can't really see what the vibe is uh, let's go back a little bit to the um, New York Times article 
Um, it says here, okay, we spoke about the crash course. He's got Mr. Henson, uh, formerly of ASAP Rocky fame, helping him and the lady from Cactus Plant Flower. What's it called again? I, I keep forgetting how it's said in the order. It's Cactus Plant Flea Market. That's it. Cynthia Lou's also helping out there. Um, we got to speak about here with him and Virgil, a really cool picture of Virgil and Pharrell back in the day in 2016, which is nice. Uh, we got him talking about how humble he is and Pusha T saying he doesn't like it. A picture of him out there again, doing good. Um, in there performing. Um, oh, here we go. I love this. So, duh, 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 duh. he says, on potential of negative criticism, Pharrell Williams said the following. I'm a student. Students learn. Mr. Henson said he didn't think Mr. Williams was expecting any grace or favor because of who he is. He's expecting even more criticism and harsh critique. Mr. Williams shrugged. It's not where my mind is. Just because I think uh, on the side of working with master artisans, we're just literally working on the detail. So clearly he's not even thinking about it. It's not in his head. He's just going to stay curious. He says here, an afternoon with Mr. Williams in creative director mode is a little bit like playing a first person shooter. Request pop in from unexpected directions and erratic rhythms just when things get calm someone emerges from around the corner with a mood board or a vintage garment and a swatch of fabric it might be reimagined in. after being shown a hood with a novel um but useful zipper mr williams nodded i don't want anything to be just for aesthetics everything has to be has to have a real function now i honestly do think it's going to be a good thing to see this because i think most of us know that pharrell's not sitting there sketching out designs but i think it should hopefully demystify what actually creative directors for fashion houses do or what creative directors do in general i think for some people they like to laugh and pretend that they are designing when they aren't they're just picking out colors and picking choices from options made available to them from the design team so maybe that will open people's eyes up a bit um to kind of see what the vibe is actually um it continues here uh for the record day for the second day in a row he's wearing a mickey mouse t-shirt made by human made this time underneath a black soft leather biker jacket his flared jeans were in the damier pattern a tailor brought up a mock-up of the double-breasted blazer for mr williams to try on one of the designers asked if he wanted a very sartorial pocket added on the design sartorial mr williams said do you follow that guy on instagram the sartorialist yeah big up him og legend from back in the day Again, like I said, you can see some inklings of stuff that we might see on a runway here from Pharrell. You've got these big snowboard boots that he likes, the flared jeans that look like gallery apartment trousers. And then you've got this blazer jacket thing that kind of looks like a Montclair type of jacket thing. So this might be stuff we might see on the runway courtesy of him. He says this. For his first collection, he's leaning heavily on the checkerboard Damier print, but working, reworking it, sorry, in clever ways. Digital camo or Miss Williams parlance, damo flage. Oh, I like that, damo flage. And tweaking the colors away from the familiar brown and grays. He said, every season is going to be a different colorway. Um, likening the playfulness to the Kakashi Murakami's neon monogram uh, print during the Jacobs era. The soles of the various shoes will be a modified Damier pattern. Um, and on the conference table where a pair of damouflage sweatsuits um, set aside for his parents, my dad is a player. Mr. Williams, who made waves in 2007 with his oversized purple crocodile Hermes hot, hot Cores bag, is most tickled by the opportunity to innovate with the Speedy, which is remaking in several primary colors and also in an exaggerated oversized silhouette. So I really like that idea to be fair. I should check this out because I think this is going to be a very, very, very popular bag people are going to be into. So if you can see the Louis Vuitton Speedy, which people are really kind of excited about, and I think a lot of people have seen wear it over time, um, it's essentially just a very small handbag that's sort of kind of worn with one strap um, on the outside um, to kind of hold it in your hand and obviously maybe to put on your hand through. But the style that Pharrell's kind of reimagining it is that he's added this really cool strap on it so you can essentially wear it like a kind of a side bag type of thing and it's the perfect size as well because it's small enough to be like a little side satchel thing and it's also big enough to carry you know some noise cancelling headphones a sandwich a book 
you know, a couple of shanks, <laughs> maybe some, you know, some pens to tag some walls on. So I think this is going to be really popular, especially if he decides to put it in all these really bright and exuberant colors, not just have it in the kind of classic, you know, mummy brown um, Louis Vuitton color that we're all kind of accustomed to. So I think this speedy bag is definitely going to be a very popular thing that he's going to eventually uh, put out there when it does eventually end up dropping. So very, very clever that he did that. Go back to the article. Um, a yellow speedy in meltingly soft leather sat on the pool table that serves as an impromptu workspace in the atelier, almost slumping under its own very lightweight. The quote, I want to give you the same experience that you get when you go to Canal Street, a place where that a place that has appropriated the house for decades, right? Let's reverse it. Let's get inspired by the fact that they'll make some colors that the house has never made, but then let's actually make it the finest levers. I like that idea, right? Making those colors the finest levers so that there'll be no, you know, onus or to go to Canal Street to buy them unless you're legitimately broke. But still, the idea and the notion is there. So I love the idea about taking from the loan, giving to the, giving to the high. It also kind of goes back to, you know, Virgil's kind of modus operandi where he used to always say, um, you know, the moment you get faked is the moment you're successful because it shows that your designs are kind of permeating, you know, all throughout culture, um, that they're kind of being picked up by people all across the board and not just kind of fashion kids. So that's a pretty cool endorsement. So I really understand what Flo is going with on this regard uh going back to the article here uh the day before miss williams are taking a moment to chat about the designing the custom look for Miami campbell including a zipped sports bra and a zip mini skirt all in a monogram leather and debating skirt lengths it'll work but i don't know if it'll be easy sexy so um we may see a cameo from Naomi campbell on the runway that's interesting um so again another note of maybe him slowly but surely taking over from Lucas guest louis vuitton and making Louis Vuitton show completely like, you know, gender neutral in that regard. It can continues here. He also surveyed a pair of ship-shaped bag options, one a steamer-like and one a bit more shorter, and picked from various trim colors and font options. Um, this seems to be the crispiest, he said, pointing to a white trim. He held one bag in each hand and handed them over to Nigo, who stomped off down the office to mock up a model walk. <laughs> what Nigo did for Williams two decades ago, Miss Williams is now doing for those who grew up admiring him. Me and him have a 20-year difference in age, man that what was um what that does for me at that age is like oh it's still no ceilings he says tyler said to me someone to see someone at this age with his milestones with his resumes to not only still survive um so to not only strive for a new world stay curious look for something new and something to challenge himself let his creativity bleed into something else aside from just a drum pattern and then actually get it he's only strived for and did it but actually nailed it it means so much to me Tyler's really fucking laying it thick for fucking Pharrell and he absolutely loves him mate. it's really cool to see that so especially for Tyler in this kind of part of his kind of career to see what Pharrell's doing it continues here Mr. Williams new designs include the printed leather jerseys rugby's quilted denim like I said before see he's picking out all the staples so we've got rugby we've got leathers um sorry we've got leathers we've got leather jerseys rugby tops we're gonna have varsity jackets hoodies jeans cool um Mal neck blazers and gilly camera with Louis Vuitton cutouts. He was excited to walk um, to the back of the studio where the footwear designers work and go over some eccentric ideas. Miss Mary Jane's and bowling shoes, a stone encrusted snowboard boot, a design that initially um, scanned a soccer sneaker, but it's actually a hard bottom shoe. I ain't even gonna lie, he said. I was copying, uh, I was trying to do that as a Adidas for years. So let's see what happens anyway. We might see some big footwear collaborations down the runway. It might be quite calm and quite chill in terms of that regard. Who actually knows? Um, still no update on the show itself. Uh, it, it continues a little, a little earlier. He's also in front of the window where he'd set up a small studio. And while fiddling with his key station 88, a keyboard and sound controller, he asked his engineer to queue up a new song, tentatively called Chains and Whips, that he was um, considering using as part of a show soundtrack. Over the f fusel side of the psych rock guitar flourishes, Pusha T wrapped along the pointed line in the chorus beat the system with chains and whips but it was made in this room he said we just walk around it and uh looking out this window you just see all of this i mean 
We've been waiting for 20. We wait. We we beating the system, bro. He says we are beating the system. So let's see what happens. How he does beat the system. Um, I still think there's a lot of pressure on the guy. It's not going to be plain sailing. Um, this is essentially his life's work. Essentially his modus operandi. Um, you know, uh, coming all at once here, courtesy of Louis Vuitton. So let's definitely see if that is the case. And if he's able to kind of provide a very coherent, you know, presentation there when he does eventually flip in, put it together. Let's see, let's see, let's see. But I think it should be good. I think the question should be whether or not the second, third collection will be good. But the first one should be because he's worked his entire life for this moment. Even if he didn't know he was getting a job, everything he's done before this led to this decision, led to this point. So it should be good in that case. So let's see what happens and let's see what the deal is when that eventually does start. Um, what are you guys saying in the chat, you guys? What's the chat there, Mandem, saying here? Uh, I had an interview with today with Tash. I'm right. I'm faded. Cool. <laughs> what else people saying here in the chat? What are you guys saying? What are you guys saying, though? Let's scroll down a bit. Blah, 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 blah. AZ, <laughs> AZ nearly turned into a gay white man after trying the weed. Yeah, 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 yeah. Weed and me don't go together, man. I wish I was a really good smoker, but I'm not. It kind of kicks my ass and it wasn't even that strong. And I was already kind of, you know, crying and biting my lip and going loopy, man. So weed is definitely not my type of thing. I don't think, unfortunately, I wish it was, you know, I really do wish it was. But unfortunately, it just isn't. It doesn't agree with me in the slightest. And it gives me lows and lows and lows of issues. So I kind of just have to leave that stuff alone, unfortunately. I have to just leave that shiz alone. Um, what else we're gonna talk about here quickly before the show starts? Um, what else can I show you? Let's speak a little bit about maybe what's if I got it on here? Do I have it? Nope, 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 nope. Where is it? It's not on there. Nope, yeah, I have got it. Yeah, let's go a little bit about Alix. I did really enjoy the Elite Spring 2024 show. I feel like every season, Matthew Williams is getting better and better and better. I feel like maybe more so than now, the kind of the work that he's doing between Givenchy and Elite is very, very, very different. Oh, it's live. Okay, it's live now. It's live. Yes, it's live. Finally. Cool, 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 cool. Let's go. I see someone walking down. Okay, I, I think that's, um. what's that guy's name? That comedian. Um, I forgot his name. He's walking down the street. Let's see if this loads up. Come on, son. Here we go. Yep. Who's he bumping into? Who, who's how he's bumping into? Let's see if this loads. Come on, brother. Don't 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 kill me now, mate. You gotta be working properly. Yes, I'm gonna go to live and see if it works. Oh, he's bumping into Tyler. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Amazing. Paris looks so beautiful, doesn't it? Paris looks absolutely gorgeous. Let's see if it's load. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. <clears throat> oh come on son don't die on me now son let's see it should load it should load it should be here give it a moment let me just get rid of this fucking chest it's not popping over the bottom too much oh what's happening here it's not happening is it let me give a little refresh Let's give it a little refresh. Bear with me one second as my comp decides to load and go there. It should be good now. A little bit of a refresh there. Let's see. Have you ever missed too much? Come on, son. Let's appear now. Tell me what you're doing. Let's go. Okay. Let's see what the vibe is saying here. Yeah, my artist. There you go. What did I sacrifice to do this? I went from nothing. Yeah. I wasn't. I wasn't even any good. It was like saying. Oh, is it raining? Like People are saying it's raining. Call. Live. I didn't okay, even cool. Get drafted. Yeah. But I'm gonna go out here and I'm gonna keep doing it. I'm gonna keep doing it. Sometimes yeah. you. Gotta... Oh, for goodness' sake! What's happening here, mate? Come on. Stop being weird. Okay, cool. Let's get rid of this window there. Let's see this loads. Oof. 
Bloody hell, it's overcast as fuck, isn't it? Okay. It's going to be a fucking wet, 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 wet show. Let's see. Bear with me one second. Is it loads? Come on, son. Okay, we hear some voices here. Nice. You know what I'm saying? Oh, for fuck's sake, man. What's happening here? Come on, do not die on me. Do not die on me, MacBook. Come on. Give me one good last stream. Come on, son. Hang in there. Chrome, yeah, Chrome is laggy as hell. Laggy as hell. Let's see if I load on my phone. How far away am I on my phone? Am I there away? Oof, yeah. Um, it's actually people walking down a show now, man. Come on, son. Oh, for goodness sake, man. Okay, well, I see some of it already on the thing. So I might have to rewind a little bit of it. I'm already seeing a couple of boots and some nice overalls and shit. It's a full orchestra, bloody hell. Interesting model choices. Man put together an entire score, which is quite cool. Oh, there's that camo thing that he's talking about, right? That demo camo. Those cowboy boots I see. Yeah, Rodeo. <laughs> this 2012 thing is fighting for its life, man. It's fighting for its life. <laughs> it's like one of those, it's like a character in John Wick, man. <laughs> Hanging in for dear life. I like the boots. Nice bags. They kind of look like um. They kind of look like uh, Wellingtons. Maybe a little bit like Wellingtons. Maybe I'm wrong or mistaken. Again, the demo gold, the demo camo. I think this season I've seen a lot of blazers with shorts. Maybe is it is it is it some is it more, more of the sun? Yeah, I feel like I've seen a lot of blazers with shorts and shit. Especially in Paris. Oh, I love that leather look. That's really nice. That digital camo print thing is really good. That little twist of the Damier um, thing is really, really cool. I love that. Not too, not too mad at that. Oh, there's like Mary Jane type of shoes there as well. They look like Dr. Mai. They look really ugly. I'm not too fan of that. The kilt looks pretty decent. You know, it kind of reminds you of a little bit this. It reminds me a little bit of flipping um, Kim Jones. I've seen a lot of the same color palettes, all the same cuts. Bomber jackets, blazers, suit jackets. Oh, who's that? Interesting costume. Oh, look at the sound. That sounds like Pharrell, isn't it? Beautiful. Yeah, I'm not feeling the Mary Jane Docs. Oh, I love that beanie. The beanie is hard. A really thick beanie with Louis Vuitton on the side of it. That looks really good. I don't like the Mary Janes though. The Mary Janes I do not like. I like the look of those pants. That bag is exquisite with the pearl looking strap. That's a beret looking type thing. I love the look of that. Yeah, they took over the entire bridge and it's mad, isn't it? That jacket looks like an M65. I really like the look of that with the sunglasses. Not too shabs. It's absolutely rammed in at the show. Busy as fuck. Oh, look at that bag as well. Lovely. Yeah, the boots look really good. I think there's a, a few people making those type of boots. They look like Red Wing engineer boots. Really big, sort of like, you know, coming up just underneath your, um, whatchamacallit, your knee. There's some fluffy 
Oh, look at those little um, sandals. They look like uh, bare feet. They look really cool. They're going to be very popular, I imagine. Scarves and nice big trousers. There's a cart there with trunks. The bomber jacket look there. Oh, that looks very good. I'm surprised there's not a lot of splashes of colours. All of it is kind of like browny and greeny, isn't it? I'm surprised. I thought he would be a little bit more loud with the colours and shit. It all kind of feels a little bit... Um, it's giving... Uh, what do you call it? It's giving safari. Urban safari. Nice little trunks. Nice little fleeces. That, that print is definitely the genius part of it. That digi... Damir Camery type print is definitely the genius move. He absolutely smashed it with that, for sure. And some of the bags look really well done. He definitely got it right there because, you know, they sell a lot more bags than they do probably ready to wear anyway. So if you can add to those sales, he's going to be, you have a job for life, mate. Oh, look at that denim look. <sighs> That's hard. I would wear the fuck out of that look. Oh, God almighty. That is me all day long. I love that as well. Look at that bag. Oh. The yellow and brown check check mark with those boots and that jacket. Yes, please. There's some sneakers there. Oh no, they look like they look like uh, bowling shoes. Interesting. That's like a football rugby jersey. I like the look of that. It looks like it's made out of leather or something. I'm not mad at that in the slightest, to be completely fair. Maybe not the most uh you know. Not a lot of ventilation on that one, but who, who gives a shit? Is the show going to end now? Because there's people walking out. Who, who, who's walking out? Is that a choir? Oh, look at that look. I love that. With the yellow glasses. Who are those people walking out? That people in white. Are they going to start dancing or something? Hope they don't start crumping and doing their shit. Please, no crumping. Please. There's a whole group of... Oh, look at that yellow checkbook. That yellow checkboard pattern is one of my favourites so far I've seen. With the bag and the hat oh that looks so good look at that that beanie is definitely a win i'm that beanie looks thick looks like a fucking balaclava i'm all i'm all for that beanie that beanie looks hard as hell you know what i would do if i was there i'd cut a little bit of that flooring that floor looks like a stamina print as well i'd cut some of that floor and take it away with me you would probably sell a bit of that on ebay for a bit of money that flooring oh look at that suit bumbo rotted Bambara. Some of the two pieces are really good. The suiting, whatever it's called. Wow, look at that. Mary Jane shoes are fucking that's a choice to be fair. I had to see them in IRL, but double sold Mary Jane shoes. That is a real, real risky one, that one. Look at the berets. Rocky's already wearing it. Um and it looks great on him. See? It looks great on him already. That hat is a win. I told you about that hat, didn't I? I told you about that hat. Who's performing now? Someone performing? Oh no. Oh my god. <laughs> That's amazing. Oh my god. Yo, big up for real, man. Guy fucking killed it. He absolutely killed it. So I'm waiting to see what the pictures are gonna look like on fucking Vogue.com. Um, but yeah, uh, da, 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 da. big up him. He smashed it. Let's get this off the screen for now. Uh, ba, ba, ba. Let's see what the poll is saying. Let's make a poll here and say, did Pharrell smash it? Yes or no? What do you guys think? What do you guys think? Uh, did Pharrell? Smash, uh, smashes Louis Vuitton. Whoops, let's do it again. Debut. What do you guys think? What do you guys think? Let me know in the flipping poll here. Yes, no, or Axe J. You know the deal. You know the deal. <laughs> you know, one question, three answers. Let it be known. Let it be known. What do you think happened there? Who smashed it? Who did it? Who did it the best? Um, but yeah, I think he killed it personally. I think he absolutely killed it. Um, I think he absolutely showed and reminded people just how much he's, how much power he actually has, how good he is at the things that he does. 
And clearly, clearly the people at LVMH know what they're doing, isn't it? They picked him out of nowhere. He was the kind of unexpected choice. And he absolutely showed why they picked him. Finger on the pulse, knows exactly what he's doing. Consumer, all-star, world, you know, champion in consumerism. He's been buying that shit for years and years and years. High, high taste level. And clearly um, has shown it on the fucking runway. So all my doubts and stuff have been completely removed because I was like, oh, he, he hasn't ever collect, designed a collection with more than 60 plus looks. He's only done collaborations and t-shirts. He doesn't know what he's doing. Clearly he does. <laughs> Clearly he does. <laughs> Clearly he knows exactly what he's doing and he absolutely showed it on that runway, mate. Uh, I, I, I was completely wrong. I had no idea what I was talking about, man. Bloody hell. I got that one completely, completely right. Honestly, I definitely got that one completely. So I got that one completely wrong. I didn't get it right. But I, I just saw this, right? I just saw this. Hold on. Let me see if I can get this up on here. Because this is, this is fucking fascinating. Let me see if this is right. I'm not sure if this is a troll or if this might be somebody that's trying to pretend to be this guy. But I just literally saw this on my timeline. And I fucking have to share this with you guys. I have to. Bear me one second as it loads on here because I think this is absolutely hilarious. But yeah, big up for real. Let's see if it's up, it's not uploaded yet on Vogue.com, is it? No, not yet. It's probably gonna come up soon, but yeah. It's looking fucking meaty. Let's say that to be honest. It's looking absolutely meaty. Um da, 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 da. Yeah, exactly. LV, exactly Rodeo. LV took the risk and they won big time. To be fair anyway, maybe there wasn't a lot of risk if you think about it, because Pharrell's kind of been at the at the beginning of the streetwear movement as a consumer, right? He was around Bape when it kind of first was popping in Europe and North America. Um, you know, he's been around long enough where he should be he should have absorbed a lot for osmosis that he should be able to put together a decent collection with help. Like if he couldn't have done it, it would say more about him than it does about Louis Vuitton. It's quite hard not to be able to put together a coherent collection but what Pharrell did today is that he smashed it I think he would have always put together a fairly decent collection but he went above and beyond even my um lofty expectations for him to be fair um but yeah L L LVMH know what they're doing to be fair those biggers over there but look at this have you seen this again I'm not sure if this is true this could be a troll but have you heard of those guys that have gone missing in that um, submarine called the Titanic, which is a really um, awfully named fucking uh, submarine? But look at this post, courtesy of Popcrave. Stepson of missing billionaire on the Titanic submarine shared that he attended a Blink-182 concert. <laughs> it might be distasteful being here, but my family would have wanted me to be at this Blink-182 show. <laughs> So <laughs> his dad <laughs> is currently at the bottom of the ocean somewhere. Um got enough oxygen to last him until Thursday. Most likely will die if he's not found within the next few hours. And his son, instead of worrying, staying up late at night, doing everything he can to help, he's out here attending a Blink 182 concert. <laughs> And then he's speaking as if his parents are dead. He's speaking as if he's already dead. Oh, he would have wanted me to come and, and, and go to the show anyway. Yo, some white people out here are fucking crazy. This is what nepotism does to you, isn't it? This is what growing up in wealth does. You become a little bit desensitized. You're not exactly like, because this guy's an adult, but you kind of got a bit of an adolescent mind when you grow up with like extreme levels of wealth. You're not really well adjusted. That's the only issue. It's really, it's, it must be hard to grow up well adjusted when you've got money, but this is a manifestation of it. Your dad's, your dad's literally in a fucking submarine somewhere and you decide that a Blink-182 concert of all is the most important place to be. Like, this is ridiculous. And again, I'm hoping it's a troll, hoping somebody just made a profile pretending to be him and it's not actually real, but this is fucking wild. It might be distasteful to be here, but my family would want me to be at this Blink-182 show. <laughs> and that's his stepdad. That's the son in a pair of Jordans and his glasses hanging there <laughs> at the show. <laughs> it's just fucking wild. Your dad's got enough oxygen to last until fucking Thursday. Like, and you're worried about a Blink-182 show. Wow. Okay. Fair play, man. Fair play. Fair play. We all have different relationship with our parents, I guess, isn't it? But... I don't know, man. This is this is literally life or death, and here you are thinking the show is a better place to be at.
I guess, man. I guess. I guess. To be fair, any billionaire, like, it, that's another thing as well that you don't realize. Like, when you've got that kind of money, the stuff that you do for hobbies or in your free time is a bit strange, isn't it? Going into a submarine, it looks like that, for as a billionaire, is really a strange thing to do with the money and resources that you have. Why would you even be in it in the first place? Of all the things that you could do like i'd rather go on like a nice yacht you know a kayak or something but a fucking submarine it was like a shoebox is not the place that i'd want to be spending any considerable time personally um but yeah like you know yeah for exactly uh jared Miller, like five people no toilet i did see a picture someone showed there was a toilet in there it's kind of small um and it you know there's no door you just have to kind of you know squat and have people turn around as you fucking unload your bowels inside of there but yeah um not the greatest i'm not going to lie not the greatest not the greatest so let's see what i'll go on anyway what people saying in replies it's a win-win for him that's why it's like <laughs> <laughs> nigga said ain't no point in me being sad too <laughs> exactly he had a plan he just needed the platform Yay, my dad's missing, but let me go listen to music. LOL. <laughs> the stepson singing this at Blink-182 show. Where are you? His mum, where are you? How is this populated? Oh, it's 38 hours until he gets that bag. He truly won. <laughs> I hope they find a submarine. <laughs> but did he fall in love with a girl at the rock show? Jackpot. Oh. <laughs> That's fucking horrible. <laughs> oh that's fucking hilarious man this kid is one maybe the, maybe the awfulest maybe one of the awfulest kids ever right really and truly because you have to think about it that's his stepdad all right so that's a dad that's come into the picture after the fact who's kind of raised you and you kind of won the lottery right imagine if your dad was like a regular dude who cheated on your mom or just beat your mom or something and then her next dude happens to be some fucking billionaire guy you get you luck out he takes you in as his own. He brings you into the businesses. He pays for your schooling. He legitimately treats you like you're his actual son. And the way you actually thank him <laughs> is not by worrying for him and doing everything in your power to make sure that he's getting rescued and you're there at the Coast Guard place waiting for the phone call to come in if they find him. You're doing everything possible. You're even hiring a boat to do it yourself, whatever. Instead, what he's doing with the hours that are available to his dad while he's still in there is being at a fucking Blink-182 concert. That's the real tragedy of it. Because if it was just a billionaire son, it would make a lot of sense because some billionaire sons or some billionaire kids have a lot of apathy towards their parents because they feel like their parents kind of, you know, gave them, you know, kind of cursed them with the wealth that they've kind of been born into. It kind of didn't allow them to grow well-adjusted. But this kid, you know happened to cross paths with his billionaire guy way later in his life you know he got brought in he you know he treated him like one of his own and the way he thanks him is this <laughs> he's so real <laughs> oh fucking hell what a crazy guy <laughs> what's his name anyway brian what brian saz jesus christ mate this may be distasteful yeah you think so you think it's distasteful mate you think so? I think it's incredibly distasteful. Not just a little bit, incredibly distasteful. Let's see let's see if anyone's got any more info on Brian. What's his name? Brian Sazers. S Z A is it S Z A S Z? S Z A S S Z A S Z. Let's see if anyone got any more information on this dude. Because this is fucking heinous, man. <laughs> he's just at this blink 182 show eating popcorn having hot dogs buying merch just chilling yeah okay thoughts and prayers for my stepfather hamish harding as his submarine has gone missing one of pakistan's richest billion businessmen's on there god almighty mate Brian Victor says, "Oh yeah, this is it. Cool. This is another one. So I'll, let's see this. What's this? Someone took a screenshot. I guess it's from his Facebook account, right? It's just like a Facebook post. This kid's been on Facebook updating shit, but not out there in the field helping his dad. Absolute savage of a guy, man. Fucking hell. 
Hamish, my stepdad is lost in the submarine. Thoughts and prayers. <laughs> Thoughts and prayers. Your stepdad's in a submarine at the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean. Thoughts and prayers. Oh, mate, this sun is the worst. Thoughts <laughs> and prayers. <laughs> and then the next one. It might be distasteful, <laughs> but my family would want me to be at this Blink-182 show as it's my favorite band and music helps me in difficult times. Music helps me. <laughs> this kid's such a piece of shit. Oh, music helps me. Yo, this kid is an epic piece of shit. Fucking hell. Uh, billionaire is starting stepson. <laughs> Redheads are all hot. Let's pick up the touch key. Fucking hell. Okay, cool. I guess it was it. He's making threats towards females. The the male subject Brian Sazer, who made threats on Twitter towards females and towards those attending the trilogy and exorcism event last few days, has been taken to custody by the San Diego. Okay, okay I don't know what that is about. It's twenty twenty one. But yeah, okay, cool. He's out there having concerts while his dad's fucking missing. Absolutely wild boy, man. <laughs> this kid doesn't give a single fuck. Anyway, let's see if we can see the final pictures of the runway show from Louis Vuitton. I'm going to quickly end this little live stream podcast now. Let's see if we've got any pictures of it. Okay, have we got the full yet or is it still publishing? It's there already. Louis Vuitton, man. Let's see what the vibe is saying here. Get a quick little quick overview of what it looked like again, because from what I saw, it looked absolutely fantastic, man. He absolutely smashed it for real. Definitely, 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 definitely smashed it for sure. Um, let's see. I'm seeing pictures of uh, Beyonce and Jay-Z walking to the runway too. It's funny. Everyone's screaming her name. Beyonce doing that thing where she pretends like she's blind and she doesn't want to look at people. She can't do that scan thing as well. I, I fucking love when she does that. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, fucking hell. Thoughts and prayers, you know. Thoughts and fucking prayers. God, I love the thoughts and prayers. Mm, 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 mm. Okay, is it gonna learn? Is it gonna show me it? Come on, son. Let's see if this loads. What we're we saying here. <clears throat> oh, we got some of the looks. Not all of them, though. But we got some already. We've already got eighteen so far. But yeah. When it started, I was a little bit miffed because of color palette and stuff. Very muted, loads of greens, loads of browns. But then as it continued on, it got really hard towards the end. Like this is one of, this look is really good. This look here, look number 17. This shiny, whatever this print is, those shorts, the model itself, the casting, absolutely 10 points. The boots are great. Some of the derby shoes, look at that. Incredible, incredibly well done. Oh, it's looping. Oh, no, not again. This is, sounds like a nightmare. Okay, stop, stop that. <laughs> not again, please. Fucking hell. I thought I was getting attacked. Um, okay, that look there is one of my favorites as well. Yeah, the, the one that's going to be the riskiest to take is this. Those Mary Janes with the pop socks. That's a That's a choice. Although I do see Pharrell wearing it. I see, sorry, I see Tyler doing this. I, I envision Tyler wearing this, to be fair. It's going to be interesting to see. Oh, you know what we might see, actually? We might see some first pictures of Tyler and Rocky together with Rihanna. I don't think we've seen any pictures of Tyler meeting Rihanna. I don't know if she's ever met her before. He probably has met her behind the scenes, but we haven't ever seen pictures of Rocky and Tyler and Rihanna together. So it'd be funny to see them two together. See if Tyler's got like a jealous face on his, a jealous look on his face. <laughs> because Rihanna took away his boy. 
Um, but yeah, we're going to see that hopefully soon. Um, when the pictures come out of them hanging around. Yeah, that M65 type jacket there. Look, number 11 looks fucking flame. So just number 12. Uh, number nine looks really cool. That woolly hat is a win. The shape of it is f so, so hard. The jacket is really good. Love the tie, that trunk, those boots with the contrast stitching. I'm a sucker for contrast stitching, so this is obviously me. I'm all over those. Um, boots again. That digi camo is so ridiculously hard. The, that cup is going to be in production, which is cool. Oof, look at that bomber jacket with the hood. Oh, that's a tough look with those shorts. That kilt look is amazing with a little chain at the bottom. This is really, really good, to be fair, man. He really smashed it. I forgot this model's name. She's famous. I forgot her name, but she looks great here. Good little hardware pieces. Great boots. So, so far, no crazy designer collections in shoes and stuff. So, interesting to see what happens. What he does for her. Will, will he try and have... Because I don't think Pharrell's ever done a Nike collab, isn't it? He's, def, he's always added that. So, I wonder if yeah, working with Louis Vuitton... Because it's something different, will he have to take Adidas on board and do that? Or can he do Nike or something else? I wonder what's happened with that stuff. Or maybe he'll just go completely different and do like, you know, Solomon's or something or hookers instead. I wonder what he's going to do. Or hockey on air on ace. Let's see what happens. But yeah, so far, so flipping good. I love everything here so far. I think the second half of the show is definitely my favorite though. The colors on here aren't the greatest for me, but I think the second half of the show, which is definitely hasn't uploaded just yet, but this is great. So look at the detailing here with this little pearl um, extension and the, the, the strap here. It looks great. I'm a big fan of all of this, to be fair. And those uh, those slippers with the bare feet at the bottom, I think Rocky's wearing them actually in one of the flipping looks. They look really good as well. These are going to be really, really popular, to be fair. These are going to be really popular. What's that video? I was saying, get your taste level up. Yeah, fair play. It's all, it's all, it's all opinions, my friend, isn't it? Like, no one's taste is better than the other. And so if you if you don't like this and you prefer um, what's his face, you prefer Kid Super, then you know that's all good, my friend. As long as it, as long as you wear it and it makes you happy, makes you feel competent and feel seven feet tall, that's all that matters, really. To be fair, it doesn't really matter. You know, there is no good or bad. Whatever you like and what vibes have used the best out there. But yeah, great collection so far. I love all of it. All of it looks flipping good. Um, really, really like it. Really, really unique vision, personally. Doesn't look like a copy of Virgil, in my opinion. It looks like his own type of narrative. I thought the first half was giving a little bit too much Kim Jones in terms of kind of, you know, uh, a little bit blandest looking wise. But I think the second half of the show definitely popped, which again is a good because usually you'd imagine the first half would be the hardest and it kind of tails off. But I felt the second half of the show really got strong as it continued. The styling was really on point. Um, everything looked great on everybody. Uh, fit wise, drop wise, it looked, looked comfy and shit. The boots looked great. Color palette was great. Um, and shapes and stuff and great little staples, twists and stuff and tweaks here and there. So I'm eager to see what happens. But like I said, I think those Mary Janes are going to be the one that's going to be divide a lot of people. But I see, I could definitely see Tyler wearing this entire look, maybe without the shirt. I could definitely see him wearing this with a t-shirt and that beret and those fucking high, 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 high shorts and those pop socks and Mary Janes. They're definitely going to be funny to see who's going to be able to rock them and make them work. But I, I envision these slippers to be very, very popular here in look number 15. They're definitely going to be very popular with people. They're going to be all over them these little Louis Vuitton slippers with the bare feet at the bottom. So check those out if you haven't already. Check it out if you're already. Anyway, that is it for now. I'm going to wait for the show to load properly. Now I'm going to do a proper review of the show and break it down later on in another episode of the pod. But for now, thank you for tuning in to the Excellent Zing Show episode number 686. It's been a pleasure to have your company and see how great this flipping collection was. Curtis of Pharrell, he absolutely smashed it and really did deliver a really amazing collection so far. So big up him for defying the odds. Big up him for defying the odds. Anyway, that's been it for so far. Hope you enjoyed the show. Um, if you've watched it and you've enjoyed it, please make sure you smash the like button down below. That'd be greatly appreciated. And I'll see all you guys again very, very soon. Take care. Be safe, chat. Peace.